Uh, question of the day is a good one. It's a story that's probably, for many, have not heard it in a long time because for some reason it doesn't get the play that perhaps it should. It's found in 2 Kings chapter 6. A couple weeks back I was mowing the front yard and with all the rain and everything and we're renting a home in Salem and it's got a huge front and backyard. I mean, it's huge. And they, the, the gentleman that uh, owns a home left his ride and lawnmower there, but it doesn't have a bagger. And so it's, I'm, you know, I was like, I've got to do something with all these clippings because you can't really even mow. There's so many. So I was raking them by hand, and my neighbor walks over and says, Hey, Doug, why are you doing that? There's a better way. Why don't you borrow my ride lawnmower? It's got a bagger, and you can run over these clippings, and I'll show you. So she goes over there and gets this really nice ride lawnmower with this fancy bagger attachment and proceeds to run over a few of them, and just they were gone. I said, you'll let me borrow that? And she says, sure, why not? It's more effective that way. And I said, okay, thanks. So I proceeded to do the front, go back, empty it, start the back, go back and empty it. And each time I would get off to empty it, you had, the engine goes off. And the second time it made a funny click, and I was like, I don't know about that. That didn't sound right, but it's not my mower, so okay, whatever. Um, the third time I back up, and I'm at the very back of our property, as far from the house as you can get, far from her house, and um, I unloaded it, it got back on there, nothing. I broke it. I, I don't know how that happened, but it just seems like when I borrow stuff, tools especially, or equipment, it never fails. It breaks, or it, 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 you know, something happens, and I'm trying to be more effective and try to use the right stuff, and, but it was a borrowed tool, and it, I messed it up. And so when you think about being effective and borrowing stuff, um, this story may resonate with a few of you, and uh, if not, there's something in it for everybody today about um, where did it fall is the question of the day. So let's look at 2 Kings, uh, 2 Kings 6, uh, chapter, uh, chapter 6, verse 1. One day, the group of prophets came to Elisha and told him, As you can see, this place where you meet with you is too small. Let's go down to the Jordan River where there are plenty of logs. There we can build a new place for us to meet. All right, he told them, go ahead. Please come with us, someone suggested. I will, he said. So he went with them. When they arrived at the Jordan, they began cutting down trees. But as one of them was cutting a tree, his axe head fell into the river. Oh, sir, he cried, it was a borrowed axe. Where did it fall? The man of God asked. When he showed him the place, Elisha cut a stick and threw it in the water. And at that spot, the axe head floated to the surface Grab it, Elisha said, and the man reached out and grabbed it. It's an incredible story. It's a story that we can all learn some very unique things from. The first one that I would like to talk to you about, uh, right at right the first two verses, the student, uh, many theologians would say this was the first seminary or first college. Because remember in the Old Testament, God spoke to his people through a prophet. God's representative on earth was these men that were often feared. A couple weeks ago, remember when, when Samuel walked in, uh, they were afraid because they thought, oh, no, he's going to bring another word that's, you know, <laughs> what's he, what's he going to say to us? The prophets, because they represented God, sometimes they passed judgment. Sometimes they passed blessings. But they were, they were powerful people. And these first two verses say these were young prophets, and Elisha's the chief of prophets, right? Elijah was the prophet that just disappeared with, uh, in heaven with God, and, and when Elisha was his disciple or his apprentice, if you will, he said, I want a double blessing, and he got it. And so he's he at, in and involved around Elisha and his story. There's incredible miracles that he does time and time again. And so when you think about what these young men come to him and say, you would think, now wait a minute, something's backwards. And the principle I want us to talk through for just a minute is that vision doesn't always start at the top. Elisha didn't lack for vision. He didn't lack for leadership. This was a man's man. This guy was incredible. And yet it was the students of the seminary that came to him and said, hey, the place we're meeting is too small. Let's do something about it. Now, for a couple months on Wednesday nights, early in my time here with Elmdale, we talked about what's the vision for your church? What's God's vision for you? 
And there's a lot of people that say, well, let's wait till we get a pastor. He'll give us a vision, and then we'll go get it. He'll help us go get it. The truth of the matter is pastors come and go, right? You've had a search committee before. It's not the first or last time that that'll happen. For most churches, pastors come and go. Who's the constant? You are. And it's well within God's design for you to capture a vision for something that you possibly should be about or that you should possibly do. And these students, they come to him, this man among men, and say, hey, there's an issue here. We have a need. And you know what? We can do something about it. So they approached him, and they got busy. Vision doesn't always start at the top. Secondly, these young prophets knew that it was a joint project. It said they all went down to get logs. In other words, they were going to cut timber to build this building that they knew they needed. And every one of them was involved. Now, this wasn't their gift. They weren't builders by design. I'm sure there were probably some that had the knack for that. But that wasn't what they were doing. They were prophets. They were men of God. Are, are soon to be prophets out in the countryside spreading God's word to the people. And yet, every one of them knew that there was something about God's plan that they had to be a part of. And that's fascinating in the context of our local churches today, isn't it? 20% 20, 20 of our attendees give 85% of the resources. About 15% of our church members serve in about 90% of the, of the um, vacancies within our church. The same people seem to be involved in most of the ministries and carrying the burden. If we advertise a neighborhood work day, how many show up? If we say we're going to go visit the nursing home, how many of us say, I'm in, that's me? The reality is it's only a handful of people. There have been people who have attended churches most of their entire life, and all they do is come and sit on Sunday morning, occasionally Sunday night or Wednesday night, and they're okay with that. By God's design, it's a, it's a joint project. There are greater numbers of those who have never gone to work in poor areas or never gone on a domestic or international mission project, leaving that just for a few. That's the second thing. The third thing is, when they got there and they started working, one of the students lost his cutting edge. He wasn't effective anymore. What happened? The axe head flew off. There's a couple interesting things about that that are really significant. Back when we were talking about David two weeks ago, um, most people think, based on other verses throughout Samuel and, and before that, that around that time, the Israelites had been in captivity, that there was a real shortage of metal. In fact, most theologians say that when David went out to face Goliath, the only person that had a sword was Saul. That the Israelite army had clubs and sticks and, and, and farm implements to fight the Philistines. Um, when Jonathan went in, Saul's son, Jonathan, David's best friend, when he went and killed all those Philistines, he was the only one of the, of the Israelite army that had a sword that had any kind of metal on it. And he took it and charge the enemy camp anyway. And so the, the thought is that if, if someone at this point in history, in the 8th century B.C., was of the Israelite um, nation, they probably didn't have a whole lot of axe heads running around. This was rare. It was expensive. It cost something. And he's out there doing his part to build this seminary and, and fulfill the vision that they've, they've come up with as a group and he can no longer participate because his axe head's in the middle of the Jordan River. That's a problem. So he no longer had the ability to be effective. Now let me ask you a couple questions. What is effective look like for a church? What's effective look like for a Christian? So if someone is to say, okay, you're an effective Christian... How do they know? And how do we look at the context of Elmdale or any church for that matter and say, that's an effective church? I mean, that's a big message, right? There are some that say, you know, there's no such thing in the Bible as a mega church. Well, the reality is, I don't think the scriptures have a lot to say about that. But I know what they have a lot to say about. 
They have a lot to say about lukewarm Christians, about Christians who receive the grace of God and then do nothing with it. And the Scriptures has a lot to say with churches who hear the Word, who participate in the Word, but don't do anything with it. So I don't really get to answer that one for you. I think you can answer it for yourself. But when someone says, you are or not an effective church, what does it look like? If our baptismal waters are still, if we're not actively reproducing ourselves in the community, there's plenty in the scripture to say that, wait, you get to participate. It's not a have to, it's a you're able to and you're expected to participate. Like this young student, many of us have lost our effectiveness, our churches, and many of our people. It was a bar to axiad. A few chapters earlier, we talked about that. Man, this was a shortage. And this is a big deal. And, and, and he lost it. There's nothing left to work with. He could only swing the wood and act busy, but he didn't get to participate. And there was a problem. And he did what he was supposed to do. He went to the person that could do something about it. He appealed to his leader. You know, we are on borrowed equipment as well. God has, if you've embraced the claims of Christ and trusted Christ, you are part of his army of God, of his people here on earth. And he's given each of you a task. And the things that you need to complete that task, you've got everything you need within you. He's equipped you and he's called you. And it's borrowed too. Have you heard of the verse, greater is he that's in me? Our it's not by my might or by my strength, but by his power. Those are the kinds of things that are inborn in those who are trusted Christ. And we have the power to do what God has called us to do and given us directions to do. He calls us and he empowers us to accomplish all those things. The fifth thing is when we do lose our cutting edge, we can get it back. That's great news. If you find yourself like, man, I'm really not doing it like I used to do. I used to have a fervor and a zeal for the Lord, and it was nothing for me to get up and share. What happened? Well, you can get it back. The question today is, where did it fall? Now, think about a river. How many of you stood beside the banks of the river? And it, it's kind of, it moves. So it's really hard to say, that's where it fell, or that's where it fell. As soon as you take your eyes off that spot, it's going, I think it's somewhere around there. But that was not... What Elisha asked him, he asked him, where? Specifically, where did it fall? And so then he said, it's right here. Well, here's the deal. He knew where it was, and he showed him. For many of us, self-awareness is such a hard deal for us. It's countercultural to our American society, but it's also countercultural to the, to the Christ follower. Paul tells us multiple times, you know, hey, be careful. Don't think of yourself more than you ought. Why does he do that? Because we get blinded, and we think of ourselves in ways that we shouldn't think of ourselves. And so there's this spiritual dullness about us, and it's really hard to see ourselves the way that we ought to. We act like if we are good enough, or if we're good, that that's good enough. Once we find that we have lost it, then there's some responsibility for our restoration of it. Elisha could have threw that stick in the water just like he did and had that axe fly up out of the water and land right back on that, on that uh, handle. But he didn't. What did he do? He made it float, which is a miracle in itself. But what did he do next? He said, you take it. There's a responsibility for you as a Christ follower to take the effectiveness that, that we are called to do. Faith is a substance. It's tangible. You have to reach out and take hold of it. And sometimes doing what God has called us to do requires that faith. It's hard. So where do we go from here? A couple of questions. What is your vision for your church and your involvement in it? What is your vision for this church and what is your involvement in, in it? The scriptures tell us that where there is no vision, the people perish. So I think there's some things you need to know. Time and time again, we see God's anger in the scripture over injustice to poor people, over injustice to people that can't take care of themselves. He tells us that pure and undefiled religion is this. It's taking care of widows and orphans. You don't have a vision for your church? 
there's a good place to start. We also know that the children are at the very heart of God and and very few exceptions. When he was walking through the countryside and the people, who did he give preference to? Always the children. In fact, he rebuked the deacons one time. When, I mean, the deacons. He, he rebuked the disciples and said, What are you thinking? Let those little children come to me. If you prevent those little children, it, it's, it's bad news. And so we know that God has a passion and heart for children. If you need a vision for your church, how about the children of this community? That's a good place to start. If you need a place to serve, there are plenty of places to serve. I went to a, a leadership conference at a massive church in Chicago many years ago, and two things stuck out at me. One was they had this man share that was a retired mechanic. He was not an eloquent man. He was not a, he was not a rather handsome man either. He was just a general old guy that had a passion for cars, and he loved God. And he came to the pastor and he said, you know, we do a lot of things here and none of them fit me. I'm not wired that way, but I want to serve God and I've got an idea. And he started what they called the cars ministry. And essentially what he did, he, it's a, I told you it's a big church, it's a massive church. They started asking people, instead of trading in your car, give it to the church. And he started taking these cars and detailing them, fixing them, make them roadworthy and make sure that everything was right. And they started identifying single moms in the community, and they gave them away. It's a huge ministry. Men started going, hey, I can do that. I can help with cars. I love that. It was a ministry. And where did the vision come? From the leadership? No. From someone sitting in the pew just like you who said, I can't sing. I can't preach. I don't want to teach. But I can work on cars, and I know people need them. And so they would take these mom's cars and they would fix them and they would give them new cars. And they had a whole garage just designed for the cars ministry of their church. And you say, well, that takes um, a lot of money and time. It sure does. Who's got it? We do. That's one thing. The second thing was, uh, I, I, call, I, I jokingly say I have ADD. So during one of the long sessions, I slipped out to go to the restroom. And... The previous session, this is a huge stage, and this guy was up doing this drama, and they, they were spinning, literally spinning plates on a stick, and they were talking about how you keep the plates in the air and all that. And this guy was a really good actor. I mean, this was professional done. And, and so, I mean, he's, you know, that's a pretty neat deal. That guy's up on stage. And I walk in, and he's got a backpack vacuum cleaner on his back and a belt holster of cleaning supplies, and he's cleaning the urinals in the bathroom. Nobody's around, just me. This bathroom's like going to a stadium. You know, this auditorium seats 5,000 people, so it's a big place. And I said, didn't I just see you on stage? Yeah. What are you doing in here? And he said, that's my talent. That's what I do for a job. I'm a drama teacher. This is my passion. I love to clean. I love to serve. And this whole building is cleaned by volunteers. We don't pay anybody to clean our building. And I'm on the team that gets to do that. Here's a man that had talent that you and I would go, man, I'd love to have that. That's not what filled him up. His part, his vision was I want to serve. And I want to do the things. And you know what? Nobody would have seen him. If I would have been where I was supposed to be, I wouldn't have run into him. And yet, I walked away going, oh, God. <laughs> Let me have that kind of attitude. I'm not, I don't want to clean, but I've got to find what can I do. And get a, get a part of it. We all have a role. And there's something about us being part of a project. Thirdly, perhaps you find yourself going, you know, I don't have that passion that I used to. Some of you just enjoy sitting and that's good enough for you. But perhaps there was a time when you were active. Um... But I've, I've heard excuses, well, I've got parents to take care of now. Or, you know, I used to do that, but I'm, I, I don't want to do that anymore. Jesus says hard things about being a Christ follower. He tells us that if you want to follow him, you have to hate your mother and father. That's a hard thing, isn't it? It's kind of hard to get your arms around. He, he, he talks to one of his guys that come to him and say, I want to follow you, but first I need to go home and take care of my mom and dad. And he says, foxes have dens and you know basically he says 
That's an excuse. Follow me today. Today is the day to be involved in God's ministry. Today is the day to be involved in redeeming those around us. And it takes sacrifice. It's not easy. But the stakes are huge. The people that don't know him, the 53% of Springdale that claims no religious affiliation, they will, they will spend eternity apart from God unless you and I do something about it. So identify where it is possibly that you've lost your effectiveness and ask God to show you if you need to. Perhaps you really do, don't really see it. But here's how I know that there's people not doing what they're supposed to. We have a prayer sheet on Wednesday nights, and every week we pray for Sunday school workers in the children's ministry. Every single week. Every week. Somebody's not listening. <laughs> there's, there's, there's kids here that need someone just to love them every single week, and we can't fill it. If there's identifiable holes and gaps in the leadership, somebody's not doing it. So who is that? Perhaps it's you. Now, the other thought is, maybe none of the traditional ways work for you. That's okay, too. Pitch a new idea. We'll get behind you. We'll, we'll support that. Start a cars ministry. It works. There, are some, there is something for you to do. God, in God's word, there is no place for us to be saved and to sit. We all have somewhere where we can serve. So, I believe the time calls for us to really believe and examine who we are and what we know to be true and what we think God's vision is for this place. Is Elmdale going to be a church that's a place for the wounded and brokenhearted? Is it going to be a church who is content with baptizing a half a dozen people a year? Or is this going to be a church and a place where those who are seeking Christ can come to know, love, and serve him just like we're doing? Are you relying on others to do the work knowing that you are capable but just not interested? Are you relying on others? Are you one of the 80% that says they can do it? That's a great idea. You do it. Perhaps you think you have nothing to offer. I believe that's one of Satan's greatest lies. He tells you, we're not good enough. You made so many mistakes. You don't deserve to teach. And that's a lie from the enemy. That's a lie straight from the enemy. So what is your vision? What is our vision? Won't you grab an axe and take part? And here's one last word I'll leave you with. The gravitational pull of the earth couldn't keep the axe head down when God said, I want it to come up. And there are going to be forces that pull against you. The enemy doesn't want you to be involved. And that pull is great, but God is greater. Grab an axe. Let's get busy. Let's stand and pray.